Welcome back to the Goldmark Gallery and a brand new ceramics exhibition of pots by the wonderful Ken Matsuzaki. This is um, a really fascinating show and it really marks um, a, a quite a profound moment in his career. This is now 50 plus years into his, his career as a, as a potter in Japan, um, firmly established as one of the most revered potters uh, uh, where he's working in Mashiko. As you can see from the title of this exhibition, To Kaiseki, a word you won't have recognised, this is a show that explores a very new kind of work. We'll see some pots here today that you might recognise, some shapes, some glazes that you're familiar with, but also a completely different new way of working that Matsuzaki has adopted in the last two or three years. You'll also see, as we go around this exhibition, some beautiful, beautiful flower arrangement. We've had um, the wonderful Ria Day here, who is uh, a master of Ikebana flower arranging. She's done a fantastic job of um, bringing this exhibition to life. Um, so do keep an eye out for those uh, beautiful arrangements as we go around. To kaiseki then, a word that we're not familiar with and actually most Japanese people wouldn't be familiar with because it's a term that Matsuzaki has coined for this new range of work that he's been working on for the last few years. It's a word that really breaks down to three parts. To, pottery or clay. Kai, uh, a term that can mean sort of like a lump or a mass, like a hunk or something. And seki, stone. Those three characters give an idea of what it is that Matsuzaki is looking for in this work, because um, a lot of it is not thrown on the wheel, uh, as much of his work has been in the past, but is built using large slabs of clay. Really, Tokai Seki for Matsuzaki is about getting as close as he can to the energy of the natural world, to finding some kind of expression of what real stone, what the, the real sort of centuries, millennia old landscape looks like. You can see from this beautiful, this is one of the uh, knockout pieces in the show, I think, um, that the approach to the clay is um, very, very simple, uh, very, very straightforward. What Matsuzaki is looking for in his Tokaiseki works are three things, roughness, smoothness and sharpness, the three things that you might find in the natural world around us. And he's been very selective about the clays that he uses and the way that he approaches them to try and make pots that have um, a reflection of that natural world about it, that capture some of that power. You can see a few different surface qualities on this pot. You've got these very smooth passages where the clay has been cut with a, a knife. You have this beautiful wave-like pattern in the surface of the clay here, where other sections have been cut off using a wire. And then you have some of the rougher textures in here from where the clay has been pried apart and torn using sticks and other blunt tools, using his hands combining a number of different tools and approaches to um, show off the, the, the natural body of this clay. Now, if you come along with me uh, to these next couple of shelves here, we can see some more of this uh, beautiful Tokaiseki work. And you'll see that it's uh, a far cry from what Masasaki has uh, often produced in the past, from the beautiful green uh, Aribe glaze, which we'll see in this show, from the, uh, the poolings of ash in his Johan work. Here we've got black and white. This is where Tokai Seki began for Matsuzaki. Two or three years ago, he had a joint exhibition with uh, another Japanese potter by the name of uh, Taizo Kuroda. The theme of the exhibition was black and white. Kuroda is a, a porcelain potter. He provided the white pots. Matsuzaki was tasked with making the black. And from there, the kernel of this idea began. And a lot of the Tokaiseki works that we'll see in this show are in black and white. In fact, they're colors that Matsuzaki has given uh, names to. The black is termed yugen. That's a, a term that combines a character for black, but also a character for play. 
This is not a true black, a pitch black. It's a black that Masaseki has produced using a clay with oxidized minerals that he's added to it. And it gives a beautiful variation of colors. You'll see on some of these pots a sort of almost like a purpley color, almost like a licorice in this black. Sometimes you get little uh, uh, hints, little passages of very, very dark blue. Some of the color reminds me of the darkness that you get in a, in a pool of water or a puddle uh, when it's been raining in, in uh, Japan. They get as, as much rain as we do here uh, in the UK. We've also got this beautiful hakuji, uh, this white porcelain work. Uh, hakuji using very old uh, kanji um, uh, for this color. The porcelain pots that you'll see in this show are not maybe what you come to expect when you have the word porcelain in your head. Often we think of porcelain as being something very smooth, very clean, very neat, very sort of glossy and shiny. But as I said earlier, Masasaki in the Tokaiseki works is trying to get back to as close as he can to the state of clay when it's taken from the earth itself. Trying to find that very fine balance between something that is artistic and expressive, something that is definitively his, that bears his signature but also something that has that kind of mysterious primal feeling, that feeling of something that's been worked just enough that you can tell that there's been a hand involved, but that still has that quality of something uh, vital, uh, something that has energy, of that sense of, um, uh, of real power that the natural world can have. Part of Matsuzaki's desire to find something new, to develop this new Tokaiseki work, has been um, his thoughts about um, his sort of development as a potter, his progress as a potter. So in this show, though we'll see uh, many shapes and forms and glazes and surfaces that are familiar, as in these beautiful um, sort of almost gourd-like uh, vases here, uh, with some beautiful pooling, this natural ash, a lovely arrangement in that middle one. He's also been very careful to um, think about um, how Although much of the work has stayed uh, similar, it's his thoughts, his hopes and his feelings, the change that's within him uh, that's happened over the years that's brought out this new development in the work. We saw in a couple of those pots uh, just now work that was almost completely unglazed, um, work where the clay was really allowed to completely speak for itself. And that also comes into the way that Matsuzaki treats the clay. Um, most potters will need their clay before they work it to make it uniform, to get rid of those pesky air and water bubbles. The clay that Matsuzaki uses to make this Tokaiseki work um, is not needed in the same way. It's beaten around a bit, but um, it's retained some of its natural qualities. Often that means that it will crack as it's formed and that things that would normally present a problem to potters are part of the desired uh, effect, the desired look for this work. We see here some more Tokaiseki work, but um, here we've got work that's been glazed, um, and, and most of it by um, natural ash. Um, there is some Shino work here too, as well. Much of Matsuzaki's Tokaiseki work is wood-fired, and it introduces a, a completely new character, a completely new um, participant in the, the process. You'll see this beautiful white porcelain down here where ash has started to pool on the top, where we've got some carbon trapping going on. There's a beautiful change in the colour. These wonderful greens that have been brought out by this ash that's formed a glaze on the surface of this, of these, of this pottery. This wonderful darkening of the surface here. And then on some of the Shino work, these amazing surface qualities. This is a lovely little tea caddy here with a lid. But the Shino you can see here has a beautiful, beautiful, lustrous surface. In a minute, I'm gonna get into quite what Johan means for, um, for Matsuzaki. It's a term that really means kiln change, um, a very simple term, but one that covers an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily broad range of, of effects that can happen within the kiln. Um, the effects of the atmosphere, of uh, the fuel that he's using, um, things that he's adding to the kiln to change the atmosphere, to make it very heavily reduced, which brings out some of the fantastic colours in this Shino work. 
we can also see, just while we're here, um, how some of this tokaiseki work is made. A large piece of clay is brought to, to Matsuzaki and at first it needs to be hollowed out. Um, that's, used, uh, that's done using a, a stick through the middle of the, uh, the lump. The clay is pulled down over the stick so that you get a, a, a hollow through the center. He can then set that on his wheel and start to, to work on the, on the clay, to start cutting, to start peeling, um, breaking pieces away, um, gently uh, uh, coaxing that surface so that he gets the effects that he wants. The, the work then has to be completely hollowed out from the inside um, for many of these pieces um, before the, the neck is then sort of finished. It's a wonderful um, a thing to watch him doing, a, a, a very interesting thing to see him, him working in a completely different way. But actually there's a lot of similarity to the way that Matsuzaki throws to the way that he makes these tokeseki works. There is a kind of movement in the way that he's looking at the clay, a kind of um, discovery of, of the form in front of him. If you've ever seen our videos of Ken uh, throwing Chawan off the hump, uh, off a, a large lump of clay in front of him, you'll see how much he lets the bowl sort of appear in front of him, how certain things that might happen, certain rhythms uh, as the bowl is, is revolving in front of him, um, dictate and affect the way that he then uh, shapes the bowl. It's much the same with this tokeseki work, I think. Um, the way that he's peeling away the clay, the way that that sort of reveals the surface underneath and maybe reveals things that he hadn't quite seen before. Irregularities in the, in the clay surface or, or um, perhaps the, the, the tool hasn't quite cut in with the, um, the, the shape that he wants. It's those little, I won't say accidents, but those little changes, those little dips in the rhythm that um, lend some of this work, it's real movement. Um, you'll see that particularly in the way that the wire work kind of gives this lovely flow to the pieces. We'll see that in a couple of the Aribe works in just a minute. A lot of what makes Matsuzaki's Tokaiseki work difficult is actually its simplicity, is the fact that he's letting the clay do a lot of the speaking. You'll see from this pair of shells some of the Tokaiseki vases mixed in with uh, other forms that he's particularly well known for and a really lovely breadth of, of uh, natural ash uh, movement on some of these pots, um, things that really show off that eight-day firing in his Anagama kiln. But the simplicity of Tokaiseki makes it um, difficult. How do you really make a statement? How do you prove that this is work that is yours, particularly when other people are making pots in a similar way? And a lot of that comes down to the firing. Matsuzaki has said of his Tokaiseki work that um, a lot of it is about its unison with Johan. Um, Johan, as I mentioned just now, kiln change. You can see that in particular on some of these pots that have got uh, this beautiful Shino glaze. Um, the same Shino that can produce an extraordinary range of colours, range of surface qualities, depending on the atmosphere of the kiln. Matsuzaki fires for eight days. That's a hugely long time to maintain uh, temperatures in his kiln, to keep the firewood burning, um, to keep the fuel going, and to be watching and listening all the time to the path of the flame, the color of the flame inside, um, to the placement of the pots, uh, how to affect his, his reduced atmospheres to get some of these amazing surface qualities. He's described Johan and firing his kiln in general as something like an exchange, a dialogue. He says that the most important thing is that he conveys to the kiln over that long period of time what it is that he wants from it, what it is that he expects, but more than that, what it is that he dreams for, the things that he can't necessarily expect, the things that um, he has no hope of arriving, but when they do, those are the beautiful um, pots that make it into exhibitions like this. You'll see on some of the um, surface qualities of the Shinos that this beautiful kind of lustre, um, in particular on pots like these. This is a, an incense burner. You can see this hollowed out lid here to allow the fumes and the smoke to escape. And the little incense box here 
where the Shino has again got that beautiful sort of lustrous golden surface quality. This is the kind of surface that Matsuzaki refers to as, as his keen Shino, or as we call it, golden Shino. And it's an effect that he can't, um, he can't design for. He can set the atmosphere for it, but it's not something that he can control. In a gas kiln, an electric kiln, he can. But because he's working with wood, he's working with the vagaries, the fluctuations of that atmosphere, it's down partly to his preparation, but also down to chance. It's an effect that requires a hugely, heavily, intensely reduced atmosphere in the kiln. And that's produced by pumping sackfuls of charcoal over and over again to keep a really heavily reduced atmosphere in that kiln, really choking the kiln with smoke. When that's done and the pot's then taken out, he has no idea whether that effect will have worked or not. So the pots that come out with that beautiful luster to them are a sort of luster that's almost the opposite of the atmosphere that was required to make them, that choking, smoking, burning atmosphere. Those are the prized pots. And it's a fact that uh, because it can't be uh, designed for, because it can't simply be calculated for, it's the kind of thing that's really prized, I think, when he pulls these pots out of the kiln and discovers what he's been blessed with. Firing over those eight days gives Ken the time to really um, convey to his kiln what it is that he wants, to um, see through some of the ideas that he's been thinking through. But it also means that over that period of time, there is an average of work that can be expected, an average of pots that can be achieved. What it is that Ken is hoping for is what goes beyond that average. It's the pots that he can't have imagined uh, would emerge. Pots like um, this extraordinary large dish that's in front of me. This is uh, an example of um, a combination of applied glaze and Johan at work. An extraordinary piece of work that um, for it to have come out of an eight day firing in one piece with this beautiful, almost like a, a koi carp pond effect in here with these large Shino brush marks and the beautiful ash glaze that's pulled in the center. This is the kind of work that we're talking about when, um, when Ken talks of work that sort of goes beyond his expectations, his feelings, um, work that, it, that he could only have dreamt for, really. Matsuzaki thinks that um, his Tokai Seki work might be the last great innovation that he has in him. Now, uh, 50 years a potter, um, over that period of time, he has done what his master, Tatsuzo Shimaoka, did before him in breaking away from um, the styles of his own teacher, Hamada, of um, definitively um, setting up his own uh, reputation, establishing himself, finding his own voice. Part of the work before Tokaseki that um, Matsuzaki worked on in particular were these sorts of pottery that um, hark back to the Momoyama period, the Shino work that we've seen, but also this beautiful uh, copper green Aribe. It's a really beautiful fluid glaze, the copper giving it that green colour, often combined with this um, iron brushwork, very sort of um, delicately applied. And it's the kind of um, decorative approach um, that can be as complex or as simple as you like. Um, so on a sake bottle or a mizusashi, like here, we've got that beautiful combination of calligraphy and the glaze. But then also on some of these other parts, in particular actually this beautiful Tokai Seki vase here, just the fluid nature of that colour, bringing out all of the the variation, the variegation in that surface quality, that surface of the, the clay, the sort of pits and scars. There's a beautiful photograph of some of this Ribe work actually um, taken uh, in Japan in the rain, um, really showing how at one a lot of this pottery is with that kind of um, that natural environment around Ken's studio. Pottery is at its essence a numbers game and for Ken Matsuzaki those numbers are significant. We're talking an eight day firing with peak temperatures of around 1250 degrees centigrade. We're talking 900 pots per firing. That's almost 
uh, half a year's income. We're talking 50 sacks of charcoal, two and a half thousand bundles of split chestnut and pine firewood. But at the same time, the firing in Ken's Kiln is an atmosphere of great fluctuation. It's really in Ken's pottery that we see that beautiful marriage of uh, precision and the imprecise, of the sort of ordered chemical, physical side of things and the chaos of the kiln. No matter how the pots are placed, the fire, the path of the flame will always be different. Even if those pots were placed in exactly the same position, firing after firing, the flame over that long period of time is always going to take different courses. The atmosphere in that kiln is always going to build in a slightly different way. And the pots that emerge are never going to look the same. That ultimately is why we love pottery. It is the basic, uh, most important thing about pottery. It's that point at which chemistry becomes alchemy when um, minerals and materials, when clay, silica, feldspar, um, copper, wood ash, firewood, come together and produce something that is inexpressible. That's the real beauty of what Ken has done in this exhibition, in both the beautiful new Torque Seki works, but also the other pots that we've seen here today. I'd love to spend more time looking over them with you. Um, do please come visit this show, um, enjoy some of these works, handle them yourself, see what Ken has been up to. They're pots that are quiet and they need time. They deserve that kind of intimacy, I think. So do please come and have a look. Um, we're sure to show you some more over the, the coming weeks. I hope you've enjoyed this exhibition and we'll leave you with some of Ken's beautiful Tokai Seki works. <laughs>